Good morning and welcome everyone to today's virtual event in which we will hear from a premier and distinguished voice on the topic of marijuana commercialization and legalization. I'm Lisa Freeman, the Executive Director of the Louisiana Highway Safety Commission, and it is my pleasure and honor to introduce our featured speaker today, Dr. Kevin Sabet. Dr. Sabet is an affiliate of the Institution for Social and Policy Studies and the Medical School at Yale University, and has been dubbed by NBC News as the prodigy of drug politics. He's an author, a consultant, and has been an advisor to three U.S. presidential administrations. And Dr. Sabet has studied, researched, written about, and implemented drug policy for 25 years. He is currently the president and CEO of the Foundation for Drug Policy Solutions and SAM, Smart Approaches to Marijuana, which are two nonprofit organizations he founded with Congressman Patrick Kennedy. His latest book, Smokescreen, What the Mar Marijuana Industry Doesn't Want You to Know, won the Next Generation Indie Book Award in the social justice category and has been optioned for a documentary film by a Hollywood studio. His upcoming book, One Nation Under the Influence, will be published in 2024. He is the only person appointed by Republicans and Democrats to work at the White House Drug Office, and he is a columnist for Newsweek. Dr. Sabet received his doctorate from Oxford University and his Bachelor of Arts from the University of California at Berkeley. And with that, we invite you to join us as we welcome a subject matter expert on a topic that has so many implications for public safety. Welcome, Dr. Sabet. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa, Christy. Thank you, everybody. I really, uh, it was a very warm uh, introduction, and I, I really do hope we can have um, meet in person again sometime soon. Uh, we're very, um, you know, we see you all as partners, and especially the Louis, Louis, Louisiana Highway Safety Commission, uh, very um, appreciative of your and very important work, and for hosting this um, Impaired Driving Symposium, of uh, the one that was taking place in July that unfortunately I could not attend, but I know that um, Luke Niferatos, our executive vice president, as well as Teresa Haley, our senior advisor, did a wonderful job. And so obviously, thank you for this follow up uh, today's executive briefing on the impact of commercialization and legalization of marijuana on traffic safety. Um, I also want to thank the Louisiana Office of Drug Policy uh, for its assistance in making these forums happen. And of course, NHTSA, the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, they do incredible work. Um, not many people know about the work that they do. They do great work. Uh, and obviously whose funding makes these educational events possible. Uh, so during the presentation, I was told you're welcome to use the dedicated Q&A section, which can be found along the bottom of the toolbar to submit questions. Uh, and after the presentation, we will have some dedicated time for me to respond. I am going to go, I have a lot of slides, which I will provide um, you all after this, because uh, it's a lot of information to digest, and I don't want to sort of you know, sort of do an information overload. Uh, so some slides I'll go over faster than others, and then of course, um, but please feel free to do the raise hand emoji if you would like to uh, ask your question verbally, or we can do the uh, you can uh, do it in the dedicated Q and A section. So if that sounds good, uh, ladies, I will go ahead and, and start. Sounds great. Thank you. So let me just share my screen here different screens but we want this one too many screens you all know that problem great well <laughs> uh, a little bit about sam so you all know about us we promote uh, evidence-based approaches to marijuana that prioritize public health we are nonpartisan. Uh, we are led and uh, we were founded by former congressman patrick kennedy we have a scientific advisory board and the reason i say that not just to show off i'm saying that because everything i say today has been vetted by the scientific advisory board and there's so much you know what we would call misinformation and disinformation out there misinformation people a lot of people who are just ignorant and don't know about the problems they think marijuana is like the old marijuana from the 60s they don't realize the implications and then of course there's a lot of disinformation people purposefully and industries purposefully spreading false information and this is a huge issue we have so that's in this field and so that's why uh it's important to have the scientific advisory board and to be vetted by them. We work with multiple medical associations, law enforcement groups, public health, public safety in the work that we do. Um, I, I first want to just bring up this false dichotomy that we're often presented with 
uh, which is that, you know, we either need to legalize marijuana, which frankly has a lot of different definitions, by the way, that's, there's not just one definition of that, uh, or we need to incarcerate people for marijuana use. And, you know, increasingly as Americans realize, well, we used a little bit of marijuana in college and it's no big deal. A lot of them think, oh, it's a bad use of police resources. Let's just legalize. Uh, but of course they're not thinking through the implications when they think that most of them. And also, I don't think that they realize that there are many other options other than incarcerating people for marijuana use, which really doesn't happen much anyway, uh, or legalizing. And actually I would say commercializing marijuana because our version of legalization in the United States is definitely commercialization. It's the promotion. That's the issue. That's the impact on highway safety. That's the impact on the environment. I'm actually going to talk about multiple impacts today because I think you know it's important to get a whole picture. There are also three separate issues that often get conflated. So we talk sometimes about decriminalization, uh, which of course is not legalization. That's removing criminal penalties for use. Um, it, it's sort of like having a speed limit. So you have, you know, if you go over the speed limit, you're, you're, I mean, unless you're going like, you know, double the speed limit, uh, you're, you're usually not a criminal as a result, but it's discouraged. You, you know, speeding is discouraged. You go over the speed limit, you get a ticket. That's sort of like a decriminalization model for marijuana. There's also medical, which medical has multiple different, obviously, avenues. What Louisiana has done is very different. I would say it's actually one of the better regimes in the country. Um, but on the other hand, it still mainly circumvents the FDA, which is sort of strange because medicine really should be done by the FDA. It shouldn't be done by popular vote uh, or by legislative vote. Uh, and then number three, which is like the full legalization and commercialization of use, sales, production, distribution, et cetera. And of course, within these three items, there are many, many different iterations as well, which is really important. The main point I think that we need to always uh, talk about is the fact that, you know, this is really about what I would call new marijuana or the ultra potent marijuana, stuff that was not around 15, let alone 30 or 40 years ago, not the old joints, uh, what people would call marijuana flower, which really is on average about 15% THC, but really the edibles, the items that are infused with pure THC that can often be very high in concentrates and the concentrated THC, which really looks like this, um, it, you know, this is not just a plant. These are derivatives that can contain up to 99.9%, .9 almost pure THC. Uh, and this is stuff, This these dabs uh, are and the concentrates are really, it's a new era. And we don't really know what this is doing to the brain in the long term. We know in the short term, it's certainly not good, but in the long term, we're still learning about what it, what it does. And if you think about most of the research I'll present today is on basically old marijuana, sort of old between old and new, it's like 10 to 15% THC. That's an incredible thing to think about because, um, the, you know, it, we, we have many more products that are not 15% THC that are 99% THC that we have not been able to, to follow as much. Let me just try and minimize this so I can, um, Okay, do the slides. Okay. Um, what's also important to know is that this is not a partisan issue, uh, that this is a an issue that really Republicans and Democrats, I mean, if you look at the Repu last Surgeon General under a Republican president, Jerome Adams, he talked about this as a dangerous drug. This isn't your mother's marijuana. It's significantly more potent. Then you look at today's uh, Surgeon General, who, by the way, was also the Surgeon General when I was in the Obama administration. So this is his second tour of duty here. Uh, Vivek Murthy, also agrees with the former Surgeon General. So this cannot be a Republican or Democrat issue. This is a scientific issue. This is an issue of public health. This is an issue of public safety. And, you know, when you have somebody in the Biden administration outspokenly saying that he worries about the perception among kids, he worries about the addiction, he worries about the mental health, um, then I really do think we need to understand that this is established science that most Americans actually don't understand, uh, that most Americans think the opposite of, which is an incredible PR sort of move by the industry, which I'll get more into. Uh, one thing you need to understand, too, is that the intensity of use in this country over the last 20 to 30 years, even in the last 10 years, has just grown in ways that researchers could never imagine. Uh, we now have almost 15 million Americans using marijuana or some kind of marijuana product every single day. Uh, we used to have less than a million in 1992. That's, you know, 15 times more. It's it's an incredible number. We never thought we would get this high. Uh, and then if you look at also what's interesting is that among the past month users, so among people who said, yeah, I used it at least once in the last month, 
And then if someone said, well, keep your hand up if you used it every day in the last month among the la past month users, fifth, almost 50% of those people keep their hand up. That's another remarkable number that of almost half of past month users actually are not past month users, they're daily users. And that is a big change from the normal number, which really hovered around 10% for a very long time. Um, like alcohol, alcohol has stayed at around 10 to 12% of past month users drink every day, 10 to 12%, it stayed steady for the last 40 years. Look at the number for marijuana, it's totally different now, it's very different than alcohol. Um, marijuana users are much more likely to be using it every day than alcohol users, which is really interesting. The way that some one person, one professor that I admire named John Calkins, we actually did a um, seminar yesterday at the Manhattan Institute, which is a New York City think tank. I encourage you all to check it out, actually. It was a very interesting discussion. Um, we did it with a New York Times columnist and really talked about the implications of legalization in different states. What's really interesting, one of the things that uh, Professor Calkins says is that if you think about THC with marijuana, like you might caffeine, the typical sort of caffeine consumer or THC consumer, just this is an analogy, uh, would consume about a 20 ounce bottle of Coke a day. That's how much caffeine they would consume. Now, the typical marijuana user, if you look at the caffeine analogy, basically ingests a, a, enough THC that is equivalent to, if you think about one bottle of Coke, to 33 Starbucks Grande Cappuccinos worth of caffeine. That's the difference in THC among the typical user. That That's a pretty huge difference. A very, very, we haven't seen a difference in a drug trend like that in very, very long. So the fact that over only 20 years, the typical user is consuming so much more than the typical user was before is really an incredible number. And it matters because of the way marijuana affects our brain. And, and I'm telling you, it affects your brain, whether you're in your 50s, whether in your 70s, or whether in your teens. Of course, when you have a developing brain, that's even worse. Our brains are developing until about age 25 or 30. And we know the reason it affects us is because THC binds to different receptors in the brain. And it binds to very um, important parts of the brain. In other words, it alters parts of the brain, uh, especially with movement, sensation, vision, coordination, judgment, which is, your, of course, your prefrontal cortex in the front, and then reward and memory. And reward and memory is important because that's really the addiction center of the brain, right? Addiction is, you know, you, if, you know, if we didn't remember how much we like to use drugs when we use them, addiction wouldn't be an issue because we wouldn't want to crave that feeling again. But unfortunately, our brain has a lot of receptors and reward. We like the, our reward system remembers and it loves it, most of us. And so when you remember that you loved it and you keep doing it despite consequences, that's addiction. And we know that marijuana, the THC in marijuana, the active ingredient THC, because there's hundreds of ingredients, but THC is the active one that binds to the brain receptors and receptors, frankly, all over the rest of your body as well, not just the brain. Uh, that that the, the, that that activates uh, these different areas, and you know, as you can tell, those are these are hugely important for things like driving, right? So you know, when you look at um, like sensory perception, when you look at reflexes, I mean, I don't have to tell most of you. Uh, that, you know, when you drive, you realize that your brain is doing hundreds and hundreds of things at the same time to be able to drive safely. And you're not aware of most of the things you're able to do when you drive. It's incredible. Uh, and so THC definitely affects that. I'll get more into how it affects it later. Um, oh, by the way, when you look, compare addictive, uh, addictive purport, uh, rates, marijuana, cigarettes, and alcohol, actually marijuana is more than cigarettes and alcohol for, for teens, which is really interesting because we hear all the time, well, it's safer than alcohol. I'm glad my kid is using marijuana and not drinking. I mean, when you look at these stats, if you're, if you care about the addiction element of it, you actually should care about marijuana the most. Um, and we know that one in three people who use marijuana in the last year uh, will become addicted to it. They'll have a cannabis use disorder. Now, most Americans think that addiction isn't real with marijuana, that there's no such thing, that, you know, maybe it's kind of in your head a little bit, you know, here's psychological addiction. The reality is it's extremely addictive. It, it, it uh, activates withdrawal. So if you tell somebody who's using marijuana daily, stop using it for two weeks, ask them how that feels. I mean, it's, you know, is it heroin withdrawal where you're going into a shock and you're fainting and you're blacking out and you're shaking? And no, it's not like that. But there are some physical elements and it is extremely, it takes an extreme emotional toll, a withdrawal from marijuana when you're when you're so tolerant to it. Um, and as I said earlier, the adolescent brain is especially susceptible to it. 
Um, we've learned a lot in the last 10 years about the impacts of, you know, sort of, okay, well, we've done this grand experiment in 23 states. What does it mean? Well, one thing we know is that when you live near a marijuana store, most people, you're more likely to use if you're a young person. So, you know, it matters when you have, you know, liquor stores around that matters with alcohol, when you have lottery stores that matters with problem gambling, when you have marijuana stores as well. And, and study after study has shown that although a lot of kids in this generation are rejecting drug use generally, like they're not using the level of drug use that maybe we saw Gen X, but when you look at the marijuana rates, that's the kind of one exception, which is really interesting. It's actually undoing a lot of the progress that, you know, you all in prevention have made. Um, we're concerned about the issue of mental illness. Uh, when you have studies that come out in England that show that if you use regularly use high potency marijuana, you're five times more likely to develop psychosis. I mean, these are numbers we've never seen before. It's really incredible. That's a big risk factor. Um, you're, you know, more likely to develop anxiety disorders. Uh, you're more, much more likely to smoke, to use tobacco if you use marijuana and other substances, by the way. And what's incredible and what I think people don't realize too, is when you look at high school completion, university entrance scores, IQ, it's all bad news. It's all bad news. And of course, those of us in the field who see people use, who talk to people in recovery, this isn't shocking. I mean, it's like when you when you know people who use regularly, you see the outcomes in their life. The problem is a lot of Americans have tried it once or twice, or they used it in college, and then they moved on. Or they were from, frankly, a higher echelon in society that they had other supports so that if they were using problematically, they could they're more likely to stop. Addiction is not just genetics. It's also your environment. So they had those supports, unlike a lot of people uh, who don't have those supports. And so, again, our own kind of um, experience often, you know, mars the reality. A great example, again, I'll go back to speed limits. Um, you know, I, I know we're with the Highway Safety Commission, so none of us want to admit it, but maybe nobody on this Zoom has ever sped, uh, has ever sped before. I hope not. You shouldn't. But you probably know if you haven't ever gone over the speed limit by a couple miles an hour, you probably know someone who did, all right? And that person probably didn't get into a crash. Now, that's not a reason to say that we should speed or speed limits don't work, right? Let's repeal speed limits because it's a waste of time because I know people who have sped and they've never gotten into a car crash before. Of course, we wouldn't ever think that because we all kind of accept the science, which is that the more you speed and the faster you go and the more reckless you drive, your chances of getting into a crash, a fatal crash, a near fatal crash, injuring somebody goes up astronomically versus if you stay within the speed limit and drive within the lines, right? So we well, that's accepted. We know that, again, sometimes you might be late and it's not an excuse, but you might speed. and many of those times you may not get into any problems. That's not a reason to speed. It's not a reason to encourage speeding. That's the analogy I want to use. Because with marijuana, yes, we know people who have used. We know that people who have used regularly. We might even know professionals who use now, who are in their 50s and use on the weekends and they have an otherwise okay life. Um, that doesn't mean that as a sort of when you look at this scientifically among thousands and millions of people, that there aren't bad outcomes that we should try and discourage. And I think that's a really important point. Uh, when you look at veterans, unfortunately, veterans are now being used as pawns to by the marijuana and the psychedelic industry, I'll have to say, which is a whole other beast. Um, I'm very worried about that, too, because we're just, you know having people promote things that are not approved by science yet. And if they are approved by science, great. I'll be the first one to say, wonderful. We, we, we want things to help people approved by science under doctor supervision. We want those things. Nobody doesn't want those things. What we don't want are basically snake oil salesmen dressed up for the 21st century. And that's my worry with, with sort of purporting for medical purposes, because you go to the most vulnerable, you go to the sick, you go to those with PTSD, like our veterans who have served our country. And when you actually have studies that look at veterans, you see a lot of negative outcomes. You see the fact that they actually have worsening psychiatric disorders, self-harm goes through the roof, suicidality, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm very worried about that. 
Um, and by the way, when you look at youth, also, you see the link to self-harm. You know, we're going, as you all know, we have a mental health epidemic in this country, especially among young people. And when you add marijuana to the mix, uh, that is certainly something that is um, making things a lot worse. Let's talk for a minute about public health and industry capture. Many of you might not know the vaping industry, which is the modern ju jewel started all that, actually began as a marijuana company. Uh, and so what's understand, what you have to understand is that these industries are all intertwined, that you have all the big tobacco companies that are buying into marijuana. Uh, and basically, they are following the same playbook. And we finally have mainstream media admitting that we're right, which we never thought we'd see the day, because 10 years ago, this is what we were saying. We were saying that it's going to be tobacco, it's going to be alcohol, they're getting into the industry. And they are, they're getting in because they need this, They frankly, they need an alternative product line. This is something that's very important for them. Uh, and so my worry is that they're going to use kind of the same tactics. And we know their playbook. I mean, tobacco used to call themselves medicine. Um, you know, they used to call their brands a health cigar. They used to hire celebrities uh, and politicians and sports stars. Um, they would use cartoons and kid imagery. I mean, you know, see Fred Flintstone. This is real. Um, literally babies and children advertising cigarettes. Like we have to appeal to young people uh, and especially fun. We need to be fun. Uh, who doesn't want to have sports to play sports and be fun and great weather and laugh. And of course, we also have to take advantage sexually of sort of the sexualization of society as well. This is all the playbook. And um, we have to give, oh, the giveaways. Remember they used to have, you know, you used to see sort of the shirts and the bags and the mugs. Um, the books, the gear, you know, get the gear. This is all being done now, not for tobacco, because that's passe, that's stigmatized, actually. I mean, anybody who smokes is completely stigmatized. Um, the action is stigmatized. It's the opposite for marijuana. So we have the doctors in a lot of the states. We have the celebrities, all kinds of celebrities, actors, singers, everybody, sports stars. I mean, you name it, uh, young and old, right? Um, sp you know, sports sponsorships, getting away with sports sponsorships, which is totally federally illegal, but they're getting away with it anyway. Um, Christmas and kid things that kids like rainbows, Santa Claus, uh, you know, go to social media. I mean, this is, this took me to, this took actually is Dr. Gary Kirkless got these screenshots. He's a wonderful uh, pediatrician in Arizona, does incredible work. Uh, I mean, he took, I think this took him five minutes to find this kid friendly. So the kid friendly items, the sponsorships, the giveaways, the sexualization, folks, we are seeing this bad movie being repeated now over and over and over again with marijuana. Uh, and I don't know why we think it might end up better. Like we might like come out of the good end of it. I don't know why we think that because we, we never have done that before. And we know that these addictive industries, whether it's alcohol or cigarettes or uh, big pharma or, or marijuana, we know that, you know, they rely on a small proportion of their users to use the majority of their product. So again, 10% of drinkers drink about 70%, 75% of all the alcohol in this country. Um, that's a very important group of people for the alcohol industry. And, you know, one of the things I'm worried about on, on this is social justice, because, you see legalization being touted as, you know, we're going to give money to BIPOC communities. Uh, we are going to um, uh, uh, you know, lift people out of poverty. They won't be going to jail. And actually, this is a picture of a group in Compton, California, one of the most historically black, black cities in our country. Uh, right outside of Los Angeles, which actually, ironically, is home to a lot of the celebrities that are now promoting marijuana. But they have pushed back against this. And they actually have, I write about this in my book, Smokescreen. Um, they have pushed back very harshly because they know that when you're dealt a bad hand in life, it, it, marijuana is not helping you. It's it's making you even further and further behind. Uh, we now have studies showing that children are reporting in public housing, are reporting much more marijuana smoke than the reporting cigarette smoke. Um, that has implications, folks. When you have families living, for example, this is New York City public housing, which is one of the, I think it's the largest health uh, public housing authority in the country. When you have these studies going on showing the exposure, the secondhand exposure to a very carcinogen, remember, Marijuana secondhand smoking, you actually inhale more hydrocarbons and carcinogens than tobacco. There was a recent study that said it's four times worse 
than secondhand tobacco smoke. Think about that for a minute. Think about what our country did as a result of the secondhand tobacco smoke when we finally got the truth. And yet for marijuana, we're turning a blind eye while millions of poor kids are being exposed to it. Like that is an impact we never even hear about. By the way, we still have, I mean, arrests going on, but guess what? Incarceration rates have not gone down since they've legalized marijuana in states. They've stayed the same, uh, you know, so, or in some places they've gone up. So this idea that, well, at least people won't go to jail, that was a false issue. That was a false flag being flown. Um, there are still disproportionate arrests. And so we need to go into those reasons why, but don't pretend to legalize marijuana for some civil rights issue because it's not civil rights. It's actually very, very regressive. In fact, again, finally, the mainstream media is saying what we've said. They're saying, wait a minute, legalization is not doing good for people of color. Wait a minute. Black America isn't making money on this. It's still the Wall Street guys and the hedge fund guys. I mean, you should go to Twitter and read the the Twitter of the of the bankers who are trying to um, legalize banking for marijuana. Um, you should. I mean, this isn't like you know these aren't people that march with Dr. King. Let me tell you, these are people who um, could care less about those issues. I hate to say it, and are in it for the money, and they admit it. They're in it for the money. You should see their hashtags. They're all dollar signs. I mean, it's surreal. Uh, and yet we hear, no, 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 this is about social justice. Don't buy the lie. It isn't about that at all. Um, by the way, even if we thought it was a good thing for um, anybody to be making money off of this, even if you thought that, don't think that it's you know Black-owned businesses making money because it's a tiny, tiny proportion. And they're all going to be swallowed up by the big guys eventually anyway. Um, marijuana stores are concentrated in communities of color. So when you look at Denver, when you look at Los Angeles, um, you see uh, a very big concentration uh, in poorer communities, just like alcohol, just like uh, gambling. Public lands is a huge issue. We are the growing that's going on. We were told that the underground market would, would go away, right? Legalize something. We don't need an underground market. We can get rid of the drug dealers. The drug dealers haven't gone anywhere. They've gone richer, if anything, because they can undercut the legal price and they can sell to who they want to sell. And so when you have California, 90% of the grows are controlled by illegal drug trafficking organizations. Uh, when you have Colorado, this is uh, something that Luke shows, which is the uh, in Colorado, the free samples that are being given out. This is what the legal, quote unquote, legal market does. Uh, when you legalize and legitimize something, you commercialize it, you know, if you want to take it out from the underground. That's what it does. And they, again, the underground isn't gone. But now there are whole neighborhoods that are consumed by around the issue of marijuana. Uh, imagine what that does to families, what it does to communities. Uh, when you look at the public health reports, they're not good. Uh, I won't go through all these numbers, but the numbers of kids that are being exposed to this is really, really incredible. The hospitalizations that are going up since legalization, you might, well, you might think, well, why hospitalizations? Never heard of a hospitalization with marijuana. Well, today's high potency marijuana is causing acute psychotic reactions and it's causing people to go to the ER. Um, it's causing people to call poison control uh, numbers more. They need more staffing. You might say, well, they can pay, with, pay for it with the taxes. The taxes aren't much and they're not going to the staffing. I can guarantee you that. Um, they're going to pet projects. Um, when you look at the driving issue, which is one of the many issues that I know you all are, are focusing on, when you look at when marijuana was legalized, whether it's Colorado or Washington or multiple states that we now have 10 years of data on, it doesn't look good. The traffic fatalities where a driver tests a positive, and, and those that understand how the testing works, I mean, by the time they test that driver, if they're catching marijuana the way that their levels are in their system. These are recent uses of marijuana. This isn't somebody who used it two weeks ago. Um, and you know we're seeing this in the workplace as well. The workplace positivity through the roof, the smuggling through the roof because they're you know they're smuggling it. And like I said, the underground market. I mean, again, you now have mainstream media saying what we predicted, what we were laughed at for saying ten years ago that the underground market is getting worse, not better. The quote unquote illegal, state illegal, it's all federally illegal. Um, the state illegal, uh, you know, pop market booming despite legalization is pretty, uh, is pretty incredible. Uh, cartels are diversified businesses. Like I said, they're not going away. 
you have very small proportions of marijuana in any of the states are being sold legally. And the percentage of state budgets for tax revenue is less than 1% in every state. So it's tiny. This is a drop in the bucket. This isn't really helping. And tourism, by the way, it's not helping. It's not helping that either. You have tourists that are coming in and they're getting into trouble with marijuana. So they actually uh, are causing more health harms as well. Uh, and of course, when you look at the past month, past year use in legal states, it is outpacing use in non-legal states. So again, there, there are implications for this. Um, I worry about the stats with regards to high school seniors who reported using marijuana in the last year, sophomores who reported it, 20%, uh, one in five uh, nationally, and then 8% of eighth graders. These are numbers that are much higher than before. And the fact that 30% of these users have some form of marijuana use disorder uh, is pretty incredible. Um, you know, the studies are now showing 25% increase of cannabis use disorder. So that's addiction among teenagers now, um, which is a lot. And again, these are other states with the hospitalizations. They're all going up. Um, now, this is interesting because healthcare, you know, we know that we're trying to drive down healthcare costs, obviously with the pandemic, et cetera. Um, but now we know we have, this is all data. This is all peer reviewed journals, which we have sites for all of it. Legitimate journals, like high impact journals, not sort of journal that somebody started in their basement while smoking marijuana and they called it a journal, which by the way, there are journals like that. You'll, you, and, and there are media outlets like that, if you can believe it, but legitimate, legitimate journals finding that, for example, marijuana users now are 25% more likely to need emergency care and hospitalization. Um, as I said, the poison control calls through the roof nationwide, it's up over a thousand percent. And in these different states, this is a newer data than what I was showing before. Um, it's up dramatically in all of these states. Um, you know, we're finally able to see some of the impacts on the road. It, it was taking a while to get some of the impacts on the road. We finally have gotten some decent stats. We now know that one in four road deaths in Colorado, all road deaths involve marijuana. I mean, think about that. This is a drug that was 20 years ago used by less than 10% of the population. This wasn't something being promoted. There wasn't the high potency products that are out there, but now it's 25% of these road deaths. Um, AAA put out a wonderful report recently uh, for drivers 19 to 24, where two thirds of them believe that driving under the influence of marijuana was extremely or very, or very dangerous. That's good. But that means a third of the drivers thought it wasn't dangerous. That's really problematic. 0% of those drivers thought that alcohol was not dangerous to drive under. So we've done a great job with alcohol and we thank Matt and Candy Leitner and everybody for doing that. But we have a lot of work to do, folks, when you have 33%, 37%, more than a third of drivers 19 to 24 who think it's actually okay, that it's not dangerous. That's problematic. Uh, half of our teens now in Colorado um, are... Uh, teen drivers who use marijuana report driving under the influence, half of them. Um, again, like these are huge numbers and we're turning a blind eye because this issue has become so political that the governors and the legislators, they were all cheerleaders for marijuana. So they kind of don't think that they can backtrack and say, well, it's kind of having some problems. Let's do better. I mean, there are, I will say there are maybe a few of these politicians who are somewhat intelligent on some of this stuff. And they're like, OK, yes, like I was in favor of it, but let's let's regulate it better. But I can count the number of those people on, on one hand. I mean, the majority of them are in total denial uh, that in complete denial that um, that there's actually a problem. So it's it's really amazing. Um, new data on the um, black market, by the way, this is a pretty new data from Oregon. Um, I mean, Oregon legalized marijuana. Look at that increase in illegal marijuana plants in one year alone and the number of laboratories. I mean, this should have been going down. The marijuana market's getting more mature. The legal one, right? Year after year, technically should be more developed and established. It's actually going down. And that is very problematic. Um, most of the, again, this uh, uh, marijuana sold in California is illegal. We, we knew that. Um, and we're also seeing uh, impacts on the environment. I recently spoke to the uh, 
California uh, is basically the environmental enforcement division in California. So there's a lot of obviously environmental issues in California. And so like toxic waste and things like that, different waste and water and that kind of thing. Uh, you should, I mean, the things that they're saying, the horror stories they're reporting from these marijuana grows, they basically treat them like meth labs at this point because of the concentrates and how dangerous they are. Um, outdoor marijuana sites, first of all, they're consuming like 30 million gallons of water a year in a state like California that often has droughts. Uh, indoor marijuana grows, of which there are many, admit as much CO2 as three and a half million like non-electric cars, right? And we know that marijuana production is about four times more energy intensive than colder oil. So we hear a lot about we don't want colder oil. We hear a lot about we need everyone to have an electric car. And we, we hear a lot about please don't overuse water. But look at the impact our appetite for marijuana uh, is, ha is having on the environment. It's really incredible. What's really interesting, and we got into this yesterday in New York when we were talking, is that more and more localities are opting out of legalization, which is really interesting. So the majority of these states that you see, for example, they vote. I mean, they all voted for marijuana, like 55 to 45 percent in New York and New Jersey. It was or in New York. It was legislative, um, but it was, you know, they got enough votes. Uh, the reality is, folks, that when you ask somebody at the local level whether they like this, whether they think this is good, uh, on the local level, they don't want it. <laughs> so they vote for it on the state level. And then they say, actually, you know what, but I don't want it in my backyard. And who can blame them? Uh, I've never heard of someone go to a realtor and say, you know, uh, uh, can you please find me a house near a marijuana shop? I mean, <laughs> that's just not what, I mean, maybe I'm sure somebody has said that one time, I'm sure, but that's not a regular thing, right? And so that's what's kind of this false narrative about the polling, like, oh, Kevin, like, two thirds of America is against you guys. And, you know, legalization is kind of here to stay in commercialization. The reality is when you look at public opinion and you dig a little bit deeper, the numbers are more nuanced. I'm also very concerned about the workforce. Um, the accidents that we're seeing now as a result of marijuana, what you see on construction sites in New York City, for example, the amount of marijuana that you could just observe, um, the positivity, the safety sensitive work. So I'm talking about the construction drivers, the truck drivers, uh, the pilots. I mean, the fact that we now have in recreational states, a 17% increase, that's almost one in five new people testing positive for marijuana. That's scary. These are, this isn't like, you know, some adult doing it in the privacy of their own home while they write their, you know, fictitious sixth novel or something, or paint some landscape. These are people that have our lives in their hands, actually, when we're driving, when we're in an airplane, when we're going in for surgery. The idea that they're testing more and more positive, I think it should, we should really worry most of us. The other thing that should worry most of us is the, the new data, this is brand new data on mental illness. We now know that a third of schizophrenia among young men can be avoided if we avoided cannabis use disorder or addiction. I can't think of another risk factor with schizophrenia, which is, you know, as you know, the worst of the worst when it comes to mental illness. I can't think of another risk factor that has that much power on that outcome. It's really, really big. And then we hear a lot, well, this can be an alternative for opioids, can't it? No, actually, it can't be. The data shows it doesn't happen. Actually, what the data show, and this is going to, we have multiple studies on this. I won't go into detail, but I'll just give you the Cliff Notes version, is that you use more opioids if you're using marijuana. You're more likely to, right? Not everybody does. I'm sure we all know someone who maybe doesn't or use less or whatever. But generally, when it really comes down to it, people are using more opioids, not fewer opioids, um, and so, and so I, I really do worry about that. We're also watching some legislation right now that I just wanted to put in front of you. One is the safe banking act, which I referred to earlier. It really sets a dangerous precedent, um, by allowing banks to, um, you know, get into the marijuana business and, you know, marijuana is still a schedule one drug, despite the recommendation from HHS. And if you all have questions on that, we can talk about it at the Q&A in a few minutes. But the reality is um, this is a huge issue because it, give, it basically opens up money laundering to international drug cartels. Uh, and, you know, it gives access 
uh, for institutional investors like big tobacco to really get into the marijuana industry. This would hugely commercialize marijuana. And I very much worry about that when we're looking at this. There's also different pieces of legislation which um, basically legalize marijuana federally. And thankfully, we've been able to stop that. Um, you know, so far we have been able to stop it. We definitely need your help. We obviously have policy solutions. If you have legalized the state, thankfully Louisiana has not, but there are still things you can do. We can, we can outlaw things like concentrates, but again, that takes a lot of political will. Like we're trying to do this in 23 states. We haven't succeeded yet. And we try very hard because we're up against a massive lobby, but this should be a no brainer. You know, the marijuana industry shouldn't serve on rulemaking bodies. Um, pot advertising, we should not have it at all. We need an awareness campaign. We need a campaign about driving. We need drug driving prevention should be pri prioritized. We need tough laws on those who uh, break that those laws, and yet we don't have them. And in states that haven't legalized, sure, we don't think you should go to prison if you have marijuana, but we, we need to discourage use. That should be our North Star. Are we encouraging or discouraging? And our North Star should be discouraging. And yet we're really not seeing that. And we need, regardless of legalization, we need a public health awareness campaign about the harms, especially of driving. When you look at some of those stats regarding how young people feel about driving and the reality in legal states, a Washington state study came out with AAA saying that since legalization, it doubled uh, their um, car crashes uh, that involved marijuana. So in every state we're seeing this, and yes, we don't have a magic breathalyzer test. I don't think we ever will. So I think we're going to be waiting for nothing if we think we can't do anything until we have a breathalyzer. The way marijuana processes in your system and THC, you're just not going to have it. It's different than alcohol in many ways. It stays in your system longer. It absorbs in the fat. It's very different. So we're not going to have the breathalyzer. There are companies that are coming up with things, but I, I just don't see it when you look at the, um, I don't think it's a it's a technology problem. I think it's just a biology problem, actually, that you can't do it. So so we need to think about, you know, real ways to uh, make sure that impaired driving um, doesn't increase, you know, this doesn't doesn't continue to be the menace that it is because it's growing to proportions that we just cannot ignore anymore. And that's why I'm you know, grateful for all of you being on this. I'm grateful for the Highway um, uh, Safety Commission and, uh, and NHTSA to raise awareness because it's really an issue that we're not talking about as much as we really should. Um, we do a lot at SAM. If you're interested in training events like this, if you're interested in being a state affiliate and volunteering, you can email us. I think our website, obviously I'm biased, but I think our website, learnaboutsam.org is the most comprehensive website on marijuana uh, in the, uh, really in the country on this, on, on, really online at all. I mean, I haven't seen more, it, it, can, it needs help always. It always needs updating because the stats are changing daily, but I think we do an okay job at, at that. And um, it's definitely a resource that we're hoping you know, folks folks can use. So I'm going to definitely share these slides after, um, you know, after we finish today uh, so that you, you have them. There's a lot of data on this, but I, I really do appreciate um, you being on and I'm very happy to take questions. I see that there, um, I, we have a couple of questions um, that I'm already, that I'm happy to answer. One is, uh, uh, I'll stop the share. So one is, uh, what information do we have about the length of time for psychoactive effects of marijuana to be reduced? That's a great question because I was getting kind of at it when, when I was saying about the way THC absorbs in our body, um, unlike alcohol, which is really in and out of your system in 24 hours, THC is, is fat soluble. So it stays a little bit longer. Now, some people say, yeah, that means like if I didn't use, marijuana, you know, since a month ago, you know, um, it's, I'm still going to test positive. Probably not. It's really for most people about two to three weeks. It's not four weeks, some, but it's really like, especially with the way that te the tests are, it's going to be two weeks or so for most people. Um, and, uh, uh, but in terms of reduce, you know, some people think that if you don't feel high, you're not high anymore. And actually, the studies are showing that's not true. So when you do pilot studies, for example, they will give pilots THC, they'll go on a flight simulator, they'll crash the plane, then they'll say, come back tomorrow and do it again. And they won't give them any more THC. So they come back the next day, they don't feel high anymore, but they still crash the plane. So marijuana users are notoriously bad at gauging their own um but sobriety, basically, at, ga at, at gauging their own psychoactivity. And, uh, 
that that's really something. And again, for everybody, it's different. So I can't say for everyone, it's a two day cutoff or a three day. It's different. But a lot of studies have shown that the effects, not only the marijuana in your system, but the effects do linger on. The second question I sort of got at, which is, is there any non-invasive way to measure marijuana intoxication for roadside? Um, I mean, it depends how you say non-invasive, but I, we don't really, we don't have a breathalyzer. There are companies that are trying to do it. I just, they're, they're not accurate. You, again, marijuana is in your system. That's why, you know, that usually got to go and do a blood test. Um, it's obviously very onerous. I don't think we can just have, you know, hundreds and or thousands, millions of, uh, you know, police that are trained in the behavioral is very hard as well. Uh, we do have drug recognition experts who are trained officers, but I think that that um, the idea that we're going to have, you know, as many as we need for this, I don't think we will. So we need to do a much better job at the assessment, the behavioral assessment of those who are high on the road. And I just don't see us having a magic kind of 0 0.08 or 0 0.05, you know, number like we do for alcohol. Um, there, let's see, there were a couple other things. Oh yeah, Q and A. Yeah, so those are some of the questions. I'm happy to, if anyone wants to raise their hand, uh, or um, I'm trying to see if there is any hands raised right now. I can't tell, but if anybody does want to do that or answer other questions, uh, we were actually got through this a little bit faster than I expected, so we have some time. Yeah, uh, while we're waiting on. While we're waiting on a few um, additional questions to come into the Q&A, Kevin, if I might ask you, um, as the sort of, I would call you your, the marijuana myth buster, right? Yeah. So I'd say at least for our, especially for our, our traffic safety stakeholders, one of the two myths that we hear the most is um, among our legislators and, and elected officials who are pushing for legalization is, but marijuana isn't deadly. Alcohol kills people on the roads, right? Um, opioids, you know, painkillers kills people on the roads. Marijuana doesn't kill people. You don't, we don't have deaths of marijuana. Can you talk us a bit through uh, the fallacy of those arguments? unmute oh yes absolutely thank you for that question well i get yeah we get this question a lot right you know marijuana doesn't kill um like alcohol does it doesn't kill you now when you say it doesn't when we say it doesn't kill you let's think about what that means like you can't die of an overdose that's what that's what we're told and you know an overdose is usually produced because uh, for opioids for example because we have uh recept opioid receptors in our brain stem that control our breathing and so narcan reverses that that's what narcan does and so thank God we don't have THC receptors in our brainstem because it would produce the overdose. So thank God we don't. Um, that's what's meant by that. That is true that you don't do that. But it is as frankly dumb to me to say that you can't die of marijuana as it is to say you can't die of tobacco. We don't overdose on smoking cigarettes. I, I don't. There, that's not how you die with cigarettes. The way you die is lung cancer. Uh, and, you know, um, obviously kills a lot of people. With marijuana, there are ways, unfortunately, we are seeing death. Now, I, again, I wouldn't say that death is also not the only outcome we care about. It's very important. You can't, you know, it's, it's life or death, but it's also not the only thing. But if you do want to go down that path that all you care about is whether someone dies, in other words, if they're stoned their whole life doing nothing, if they're mentally ill their whole life as a result, if they're injured as a result, that doesn't matter as long as they're alive. Okay, if you want to go down that path, um, we do see a couple of avenues where marijuana users are dying. I would say one of the biggest ones is suicide. We are seeing now that marijuana is the top drug for youth suicide events in this country. We had never seen that before. Number two, or I wouldn't say number two, it's just another one. So they're equally, it's not, there's not one better than the other, obviously is driving. So if you are killed on the road as a result of someone being high or yourself being high, that's a death from marijuana. Now that wasn't the marijuana that, would, you know, you died from the impact of the crash or whatever from the fire. Okay, yes, that's the technical. But why did that happen? It happened because somebody or yourself was high on marijuana. Um, and then the other thing is you cannot imagine that a drug that has that many carcinogens and hydrocarbons that are, that's being inhaled at once 
isn't producing COPD that results in death. We're not tracking that, but I just don't see how this drug wouldn't be producing deaths related to COPD and other lung deaths because you aren't inhaling anything is not good for you. And when you inhale something like marijuana, which by the way, one thing we didn't talk about is that regulated marijuana isn't regulated at all. The amount of heavy metals, mold, bacteria, pesticide on state-sponsored marijuana is incredible. And that's because states are not equipped. There's a reason why we have a federal drug law. States are not equipped, I hate to say it, to be able to regulate marijuana. It is too difficult. Um, And so now that you have all these states doing this, I got to say that most of them don't know what they're doing. And they're the labs are corrupted. I wrote about this in my book, Smokescreen. The labs are corrupted. Um, the, the, the people there admit that they look the other way. And when you independently test the marijuana being sold legally and regulated, it's really scary what you find. So there's probably some illness and deaths from those as well. But um, yeah, no, that's a very important question. It's a big one we get all the time. I see we have a few ch- questions in the, in the Q&A, Kevin, if we want to... Um... Get to yes. those. I can, I can read them to you if you'd like. Sure. Yeah. So here's our first one. Courts are being warned about prohibiting medical diagnoses that require the use of psych- psychotropics as being necessary for medical treatment. Are there any concerns regarding this in marijuana? Well, I mean, the reality is... Um, these are... The, 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 what you're talking about is those, some of those psychotropics are... FDA approved. And so, yeah, like don't prohibit, you know, when, 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 so, so those, we can understand why they're being used. There are medical products related to marijuana. Um, Marinol is one of them. Uh, uh, Epidiolex, which is CBD oil is another one for uncontrollable seizures. So there are FDA approved marijuana products, which again, I have no problem with, but then to say, you know, on the other hand, um, that, you know, and I know, and I, and I get what the, I'm sort of answering two questions with this. So I'll get, I think I, the heart of the question is something else, which I will get to, but I wanted to just preface it with this first is that there are marijuana based medications that are legal and available through the FDA. Um, These other things that states are calling medicine, just, I mean, they're not medicine. I mean, they can call it whatever you want. You can call them dog food. I mean, but they're not dog food. I mean, you can just, you can put a label on it if you want, but the reality is that's, that's not what it is. And so it's very confusing. Now, in terms of medical diagnoses that would require marijuana, there aren't medical diagnoses that require marijuana. So that's the good news. Um, you know, you can imagine somebody with bipolar or something else needing some of those psychotropic. And but the reality is for marijuana, even extreme nausea related to cancer chemotherapy, there are better drugs. And there are marijuana-based drugs that you could use too for that. But those are FDA approved. So for those, I wouldn't be that concerned about. What I would be concerned is somebody saying that I have a medical diagnosis that requires me to, you know, use 99.9%, you know, bud, uh, concentrates and not bud, concentrates or dabs. That doesn't make any sense. So there's no science there. Thank you. Um, Our next question, I've often wondered if the marked increase in mass shootings and other violent crimes over the past 10 years is correlated with the increase in the use of marijuana and or the increase in THC purity? Has anyone looked at this? That's a great question. Yes, we've looked at it a lot. Um, you know, I I was always cautious because there's there are multiple reasons, right, right that we're seeing the levels of mass shootings. And there's, the levels of mass shootings are going up. I mean, there's, you can't deny that. That's the data. And, you know, everyone, different people have different theories about why. I happen to think there are just multiple factors. There are some factors that are bigger than others. That's a very cop-out answer, but that's just the reality. So it's not black and white. However, however, when you look at a couple of the common denominators among most of the mass shootings that you see a couple of them, right? You see, I mean, frankly, you see easy access to guns. You see a history of some kind of disturbance, right? Most of the stuff is not out of the blue. Um, But the other thing you see is marijuana use. It's really interesting. You see little quotes. We've had to piece them together. One of them was in the New York Times, and they took the, then they took it away. But it was in the original article. I don't know why they took it away. In the original article, it talked about how, um, I think it was, I don't know if it was the Uvalde shooter. Uh, I think it was the Uvalde shooter. Um, but it might have been another one now. There's so many, unfortunately, we get them confused. Right. 
but basically saying that he would fight with his mother about, or his, his, his aunt or whoever was caregiver about his marijuana use. Um, others, you see it in the diaries that they leave. Uh, you see it on the, you see it on the websites that they used and the social media, you see references to marijuana. So marijuana is a common denominator. Is it causing all of this? I'm not sure. However, what I can say is that it's not like, you know, they also all probably drank milk when they were young. Okay. That's a common denominator, but that's not really a reason why they would be doing this. So it's not like that. Because today's marijuana is producing psychotic reactions. It's producing paranoia. And it's producing things that are irrational that could lead to some of these horrible tragedies. So I think there is a link. And we've looked at it. We, we've talked about it with multiple journalists. Um, there have been some stories written on it. But it's hard for a lot of Americans to comprehend because when you think marijuana from the 60s or 70s or 80s, you think about a guy who your college roommate who fell asleep on the couch, you know, kind of smiling, right? You don't think of somebody violent, right? We, we, we think of that for maybe like meth, cocaine, alcohol. And so we don't think about that for marijuana. But just because we don't think about it doesn't mean that it's not true now. And I do think that today's marijuana is producing so much extreme mental illness that it is absolutely linked to some of these shootings. You can't deny it when you look at the, I mean, almost every single one. It's not, this is, I'm not even talking like 51% of them. I'm talking like 89% of them. When you look at it, you see that history. Again, for some of them, was it a bigger factor than for other people? Yeah, maybe. Maybe the marijuana was incidental for some of them. Of course, that's possible. But I think it's also very possible that marijuana was a contributing factor to a lot of them. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, another question here from our chemistry director of our state police crime lab and the vice president of your Louisiana-based fan club. She says, Rebecca says, we're seeing candy bars with uh, psilocin submitted to our crime lab diverted from legal states. We just started getting these candy bars that also contain THC. Do you know if these types of products are being legally produced? Well, thank you, Miss Madam Vice President, for that question. No, uh, I'm I'm flattered. Um, you know, uh, well, legal, not federally legally, but it's very possible that they're being legally produced in different states and being exported. So they're legal on the state level. It's also very possible they're even illegal on the state level. So I, I mean, you know, the psilocybin. So the other substance mentioned was psilocybin. The psilocybin that we're seeing, that psilocybin mushrooms. Those are now legal for medical, quote unquote, purposes in Oregon and Colorado. Um, of course, those are states that legalize marijuana. Now they're legalizing this. It's all part of the, and I didn't go into this in my slides, but it's all part of the strategy. This is all the successive order of things. And um, I'm not surprised we're seeing them mixed together. These are, they're, this, the psilocybin industry is now a, a, just a huge growing industry. It's, a, it's the in thing now. I mean, it's almost like marijuana is becoming a little bit more passe among the like, elite like you know you know celebs and that kind of thing that uh you know it's, you look around at the athletes and others that are now swearing by psychedelics which is just incredible to me but um yeah i'm not i don't think that they would be legal i think a lot of this stuff would even on the state level be illegally produced masked as legal on the state level either way they're illegal on the federal level. I, yes i actually have a question kevin uh you know countering the Disinformation and disinformation is it's a heavy lift. And I know you're all about collaboration and bringing, you know, people to the table, getting that word out. Well, could you speak to, you know, some um, a blueprint of, of sorts that, that folks throughout any state, but here for our purposes, Louisiana, which is very different in, in various pockets of the state. But how do we animate certain folks or disciplines or communities, whether they're, you know, child advocates or the medical folks, or how would you guide us in that? No, that's a great question. Thank you, Dr. Freeman. I mean, I think what we need to do, right, is relate. The marijuana issue touches so many issues, right? So we have to go to the different sectors of society and relate it. When you go to, for example, business and industry, Talking about the workplace liability, for example, because it is a huge liability. Talking about the accidents with the liability, talking about the lost productivity. And, you know, 
you may not get them into wanting to do much advocacy because frankly, they probably want to keep a low profile, a lot of them, but you might have them interested in an educational campaign among their workers. Um, so there's different pressure points. Then you go to the medical community. Obviously, the pediatricians are seeing this. The ER doctors are seeing this. You go to the, the, the specialties in medicine that are seeing this. The psychiatrists are seeing this big time, especially the child psychiatrists. And you say, you know, how can we work with you to get just education out? Again, not political, but just to get the education out. out. Um, you know, and then I think working with families that have been impacted by substance abuse. I mean, I don't know one family impacted where marijuana wasn't a huge part of it. I mean, it's just with the fentanyl crisis, it's still always as marijuana is usually the starter drug. I mean, people don't want to admit it, but it is. And so um, I think engaging parents and parents being messengers and youth, young people being messengers of this as well. And I think part of, you know, with youth, the, again, you, you tailor the message with youth, the message that I have seen that's worked for us. So it could work for you, you know, is basically youth don't like to be taken for a ride, right? They, figuratively speaking, they don't like to be lied to. And there is a certain huge backlash among sort of multinational corporations lying to the young people of America. And when you inform young people and have them do the research themselves that this is a massive industry that is based basically in Wall Street, that sees their brain as an addictive commodity for them to profit from, that angers a lot of them. That angers kids. That angers teens. Interestingly, it angers and motivates them. I've seen much more than when I tell them that they could lose eight points of IQ, even though the eight points of IQ would directly relate to their future success. But they have a hard time kind of thinking it will happen to them or thinking any of that stuff that basically... Uh, they, you know, there is um, a lot more resonance to this corporate issue. Right. All right. We do have a, another question that was submitted through our Q&A section. Uh, I'm going to read it here now from David Ritchie. It's so easy for people to get certain doctors to give a medical marijuana prescription to get edibles and joints from a pharmacy. Mm -hmm. So I prohibit anyone I sentence from, so I'm going to infer he's a judge yeah. from using marijuana while on probation, unless the doctor says there is no other drug to address the problem. As an example, one issue for which it's prescribed is anxiety, which I understand is made worse by marijuana use. So I think our medical marijuana law is 99% used for illegitimate purposes. Do you see anything wrong with my approach? I do not. <laughs> I think your approach, Judge Ritchie, is correct. I think that uh, it'd be I'd be interested to see if there were any doctors, because you have that exception that you said, that would think that it is worth it. Um, I do think that some doctors are very ill-informed on this. I mean, most doctors don't touch this with a long stick. They know better. But more and more, I think doctors are like, well, if it helps you, that's fine. So even, you know, I would even say if I were you that, again, I, I don't know your parameters, but if I were you, I, I wouldn't necessarily have that be a hard and fast rule. Because if there is a yes, like if there is a doctor saying, no, no, that this is the only thing that's that's good. I would dig into that a little bit more. Like which doctor? Is this like Dr. Weed 420? Is this, uh, what doctor is this? Because uh, there's, in every state, it's f about 3% of doctors that recommend 90% of the marijuana. For medical purposes. Okay. So to me, you know, there's, there's going to be some bad apples and there's going to be some bad doctors. And to me, those doctors are in it for the wrong reasons, because again, their entire profession, their entire field says that marijuana, unless it's an FDA approved product, isn't medicine. So if they're saying, I disagree with that field, it's like if a scientist says, well, I think that the earth is flat. That's what I think. And not only do I think that I get paid when I think that. So I, I worry a little bit about that part of it. So I don't know how many exceptions I'd be interested to know how many you have. But otherwise, I think it's a very sensible approach. Of course, marijuana worsens anxiety. It does. Now, I will say something. There are people that I don't think they're lying. Some people. Some are. But some people are not lying when they say it reduces my anxiety. I believe them. However, that's not a reason to use it. Because we know in the long term, it increases anxiety. It increases the factors. So in the short term, it may make you feel great. It's like 
I don't drink alcohol, but I, I've heard when if somebody drinks, you know, a couple shots of some liquor, they could feel great for that minute. Like it just that that felt like a really great thing to do. And then in like an hour, they're not feeling too good. Or in half an hour, they're they're not feeling too good. And so it's something where in the short, that's why it's such a deceitful drug. In the short term, it could feel okay. In the long term, it's not. It's making it worse. Kevin, I think it might be important for you at this point to talk with us a little bit about, uh, let our participants know a bit about what's happening on the national level. You talked about um, some legislation, but this very recent uh, situation whereby HHS, Health and Human Services, has then sort of um, you know, issued a recommendation to the Department of Justice uh, around rescheduling marijuana. What that you know really means, what that would mean if it happened, and 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 frankly, because we're action oriented people, are there ways that we as regular citizens can weigh on in on this, or is this a done deal? No, it's not a done deal. I'll answer the last part first, then I'll get into the details. Uh, it's not a done deal, and there's definitely ways. So if you are not all subscribed to our email list, uh, please do go on our website and subscribe. And then if you have subscribed and you didn't get a form letter or our newsletter which uh, last week, which was a way that people could actually write to the AG, uh, please email me or Brendan or anybody on our team, and we'll get you that letter. So there's a lot of things you could do. So let's talk about what this means. So let's back up. There are five schedules on drugs, one through five. They You go one is the, basically you'd say the most, uh, the drugs with the most addictive potential, five least addictive potential. The other thing that distinguishes one through five is that one is no medical use, no accepted medical use, two through five accepted medical use, but then again, varying in abuse potential. Okay, so that's the difference. So the main difference between one and two, you could have the same abuse potential, by the way, for one and two, but one is not, doesn't have medical use, and two, there is accepted okay. medical use. Okay, so marijuana has been in Schedule 1, which makes sense. There's no FDA-approved product called marijuana, called any of these THC products. There is an FDA-approved product called Marinol. That's in Schedule 3. Epidiolex, that's in Schedule 5. And sesame, that's in schedule, I think it's either two or three. So there is that. The reality is uh, that basically anybody could ask for any drug to be reviewed on the schedule. So I, a citizen can ask the DEA, please review marijuana schedule one status. And the marijuana industry has been asking for the last 30 years, every couple of years, they ask, please do another review every time. The FD, that, that triggers a process. That means the FDA with HHS does an eight-factor analysis on health, and they make a recommendation to the DEA, really to the Attorney General slash DEA, which is under the Attorney General. The Attorney General has final say on scheduling. They make a recommendation. The health part of that recommendation is binding on DEA, but the DEA can do its own uh, factor analysis, by the way. They, they do other things. They can look at things that the FDA did not look at. And then they can make a decision on what they want to do in terms of schedule. Um, DEA's schedule, not surprisingly, has never been less than what the FDA has said, but sometimes it's been higher. In other words, the FDA has sometimes recommended a drug be Schedule 4, and the DEA said, nah, it's actually Schedule 3. Or the FDA wanted it to be Schedule 3, and DEA said, actually, we think it's Schedule 2. Most of the time they agree, but not always. Okay. So in this case, President Biden said, all right, I'm getting a lot of questions about marijuana. President Biden is against legalization completely. But he said, I'm getting a lot of questions about the schedule. And by the way, schedule, let me just back up, does not mean a drug is necessarily legal for non-medical use. It doesn't mean that at all. This is about the medical use of drugs. So it's a drug that's Schedule II is not legal. Cocaine is a Schedule II drug. It's not legal. You can't buy it at a dispensary. There are other Schedule three drugs like um, different uh, uh steroids and, and benzodiazepines and things, the, you cannot just buy them at anywhere. You have to buy them at a pharmacy, right? So anyhow, um, President Biden said, all right, we're going to review the schedule. I'm going to ask a, I'm going to ask my cabinet to review the schedule. So it was almost like he himself was the petitioner this time, not like the drug groups. And that's fine. So he did that. And he said, uh, all right, HHS, look at it. So HHS looked at it and said, uh, you know what? Uh, we think it should be schedule three. 
Now, this just happened a few weeks ago. So this is now what we all know. There's a lot we don't know. Number one, we don't know what their analysis looked like. It's private right now. It's not public. It will be public, but it's not public now. So I have no idea how they got there. And I'm very suspicious about it for a couple of reasons. Number one, there's no such thing as a marijuana product that the FDA has approved. So I don't even know how it could be Schedule 3. That, that's my biggest question. Number two, um, why has this been publicly released until the final rule has been made by the AG? I've never heard of that where the HHS announces with great fanfare. At this point, they announced it at 420 in the afternoon, which 420 is the marijuana holiday. So that was kind of inappropriate. Somebody who thought they were being really funny. So they announce it on Twitter at 420 that we have told the AG it should be schedule three. It's just a very, we've never, it's just the process has become so, unfortunately, it's become a circus. And that's really unfortunate to me. And it's not really, it already doesn't look good. I mean, it just, they didn't do themselves any favors, actually. I guess they thought they were being, they thought they were doing themselves favors. They thought they were, you know, being cool and people would like that they did this. It's really a bad idea. So anyway, uh, 420 and they did that and they announced it. And now the AG, it's in the hands of the attorney general and the DEA, they're doing their review. So those letter, back to what I said at the end, those letters, please, we do want you to write them and we have it all set up where you can write to the DEA to say, please do a thorough exhaustive review. And there's really no reason for it to be out of schedule one. Now, if it does get out of schedule one, let's say it goes to schedule two, it's still illegal. So it didn't legalize. But the, my worry of schedule three versus even schedule two or one is that schedule three will allow banking access. <laughs> so it will allow what they've been trying to get for the last 10 years. And that means that they can, um, the other thing it will allow, sorry, the biggest thing it will allow really is the is the IRS 280E tax exemption. That's what I meant to say. What does that mean? It means that marijuana companies, even though they're federally illegal, they could deduct business expenses from their profits when they're paying taxes. Because even though they're illegal, they still have to pay taxes, by the way. It's an interesting, that's a whole other law. But um, even illegal enterprises pay taxes in the US. If you didn't, didn't know that, they're supposed to. So uh, anyway, uh, it would allow them to deduct expenses. Well, what's an expense? A lot of things are expenses. Advertising is an expense. Billboards are expenses. All of those promotions are expenses. They will now deduct that from paying taxes. And they really want, they'll, they'll be even more profitable. That's one of the things I worry about schedule three. Schedule two, at least you don't have that. Um, so I don't know what's going to happen. I really, really don't know. I wish I could say I have a hunch or sometimes I do. I don't know. We're putting as much pressure. We're putting together a letter right now. It'll be released soon with all the past administrators of DEA and almost every living ONDCP drug czar writing letters together saying that, please don't do this. So we'll see what happens, but it's definitely been a really uh, dramatic last couple of weeks on that front. If I might ask one more question, Kevin, because again, such an analytical brain, so well connected with what's going on at the federal level. Um, you know, we're we're particularly interested in what's going to potentially happen around um, hemp derived products, right? THC variants, um, particularly Delta Eight, Delta Ten, as it relates to the Farm Bill and any sort of rolling back of the uh, allowances that were that happened previously. Any um, hot takes? Any thoughts about how that's, that's another thing happen? we're working on? Yeah, that's another thing we're working on to close that loophole. It's a terrible loophole. It has allowed the proliferation of these synthetics, which are really dangerous. I don't have more news other than we are working on that and uh, we will need everybody's help with that. All right. Well, as we're winding down, if you don't mind, we just had uh, yeah. one more question submitted through the chat. I see so it. Like you don't to have to read it. I see yeah. it. Go yeah. Uh, about poly substance use overdoses can increase. Uh, absolutely. I mean, most of what we're seeing on the road, it is poly. I'm really glad this was asked. It is poly substances. It's not one substance. Uh, and with addiction, it's often poly substances as well. So, um, you know, were the other substances effects increased by the cannabis use? Well, the overall intoxicating effect of that person was increased by the cannabis use. Now, whether the cannabis use made the cocaine stronger or the meth stronger, 
That's possible. I don't know a lot. I'm not going to pretend to know a lot of the biological data on that. So I don't want to answer mistakenly. I will say that the poly substance use is a huge issue. And it's, I'm really glad that word was brought up because we often think about one drug, fentanyl only, marijuana only, alcohol only, meth only. 90% of what we're dealing with with the harms of substances is because of poly substance use. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I don't see any more questions in, in our Q&A section. So I'm going to turn it back over to Director Freeman. Thank you. I, I just want to say that I think we can all agree that when you know better, you do better. So in that regard, we thank you for helping, you know, the folks on this call, all the stakeholders in public safety here in Louisiana to do better. We all have um, hard work ahead, you know, but we're soldiers in the cause of, you know, doing right by the citizens of our state. Uh, we thank you for the education you've given us uh, on such an important topic. And I'd like to say, you know, we look forward to more conversations down the road. I, I look forward to it too. You have an incredible staff, incredible people uh, down there who we've been working with. Thank you so much. I wanna thank everybody who came onto this uh, webinar. I know you're all doing amazing work in the community. You're doing very difficult work. You're doing work that's often thankless. You're doing work that's not understood by most people. I, I get that. So that resonates with me. And uh, I very much appreciate you all. Extremely historic, beautiful state that I hope next time we're in person. And uh, I'd love to come down. Thank you. Uh, Kevin, let's go ahead and give one more plug for your organization's website. Sure. It is learn about learn about sam.org. Learn about sam with the book of smoke screen. Yeah. So go to the website, sign up for e uh, yeah. newsletters and and buy Kevin's book, folks. With that, yeah. we are I'm going to wrap up for today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye -bye.